It has started. The Giro d'Italia kicked off on Saturday and we're going to bring you up to speed on everything that happened over the opening weekend, including the return of Dylan Kruenewegen and Remco Evenepoel. We've also got the Vuelta Algarve, the Tour of Rwanda, the Vuelta Settimana Ciclista Valenciana and two very high profile riders who are set to leave the Koenig Quickstep at the end of this year. But obviously, we're going to start with the first Grand Tour of the year. I think we've all been waiting for this one with much anticipation, and now it is finally here. The Giro d'Italia set off from Turin on Saturday with a short 8.6 kilometer individual time trial. It was a day with three big stories, one about the stage win, one about the general classification contenders, and one about the return of Grunewagen and Evenepoel. On the day, Jumbo Visma sat in the hot seat twice, firstly with former Tour de l'Avenir winner Tobias Foss, who took 10 seconds off the previous best time that had been set by Matthias Brandley, and then with their new Italian recruit, Eduardo Affini. He locked three seconds off the time of his teammate. Remy Cavagna, the French champion and one of the pre-race favourites, wasn't able to upset either of them on the day, and so Affini nervously watched on as countryman Filippo Ganna set off from the start ramp. Now, there were a few question marks hanging over Ghana after three consecutive defeats against the clock over the last two months. But in hindsight, it was a bit silly to doubt him, really, wasn't it? The guy is an absolute beast, and he proved that yet again on Saturday with a scintillating display of power, aggression and bike handling. He finished 10 seconds in front of Affini with an average speed of 58.75 kilometers per hour and an average power over the last two Ks of 590 watts, according to data online. I mean, just in his morning warm up around the course, he averaged 470 watts for six and a half minutes. And I reckon he must have averaged about 530 watts for the actual race, which was just under nine minutes. Either way, that was his 22nd Giro d'Italia stage and his fifth win. Not a bad return on your investment, that is it. He's only the second rider, in fact, to win four time trials back to back at the Giro d'Italia, the other being Francesco Moser. And of course, Ghana has the opportunity to go one better in just under three weeks time. The GC battle also told the story of Evenepoel's return to racing after nine months out through injury. Bloody impressive is how I would describe that return. He came seventh on the day and not far behind his teammate Joao Almeida, which means they both dealt an early blow to their GC rivals. Best of the rest in that regard, if we disregard Foss, which we probably shouldn't do, uh, was Alexander Vlasov of Astana. He finished 11th on the day, just seven seconds down on Almeida. Domenico Pozzovivo quietly pulled out a very impressive ride with 21st on the stage. Sivakov was in 34th, whilst Carthy, Yates and Bernal all finished within a second of each other in 35th, 37th and 40th respectively, all around 20 seconds behind Almeida. Vincenzo Nibali pulled out a decent ride, all things considered, with 50th on the day. Soler was 56th, whilst Lander had a typically average time trial and finished 77th, over half a minute down on Almeida and three seconds behind Jai Hindley. The most disappointed GC hopefuls, though, were probably Emmanuel Buchmann and Dan Martin, both of whom finished outside the top 100. They conceded almost 40 seconds to Almeida over that 8.6 kilometers. And to make matters worse for Martin, his teammate, Chris Nalance, crashed whilst riding back to the hotel after his race, breaking his collarbone and taking him out of the race. Get well soon, Chris. Stage two looked to be a nailed on bunt sprint, particularly given the complete lack of wind en route to the finish line in Navarra. Ganna took three bonus seconds in the final intermediate sprint to tighten his early grip on the Maglia Rosa, with Avonapool taking two seconds and moving himself up to fourth on GC. In the sprint, all eyes would have been on Caleb Ewan if we'd ever seen him. Uh, the Australian just never seemed to get himself into the right position on the hectic run into the line. That wasn't the case though for Tim Malia of Alpecin Fenix, who got the run on Elia Viviani as he kicked towards the line with just over 200 meters to go. Giacomo Nizzolo tried his best, but he was unable to come past the Belgian before the line. First Grand Tour for Malia, first Grand Tour for Alpecin Fenix, and their first win came on only the second stage. Hats off, that really was quite something, even if it wasn't a major surprise to those of us who've been following Malia closely over the last few years. Viviani had to settle for third on the day. Grunewagen was in fourth, so pretty impressive for his first return to competition in nine months after that suspension. 
Now, the victory of Malia was dedicated to Walter Wadeland. He died tragically in a crash under Giro d'Italia exactly 10 years ago to the day. Rest in peace, Walter. Fernando Gaviria had been well placed on the run into the finish, but made an error in choosing to try and go around his teammate Milano on the barrier side. Milano was just trying to get out of the way of the missiles on bikes behind him, and so there wasn't enough room for his teammate. Thankfully though, the barriers were both smooth and well secured, otherwise that could have been nasty. The race continues today with one of those typical Giro d'Italia stages, which could end up in all kinds of scenarios playing out. I've picked Peter Sagan for the win, so he probably won't. Right, just before we move on, what's coming up on GCN Plus? The Giro d'Italia, of course. Our daily live coverage continues every day this week, live from before Kilometre Zero, pre and post race shows and a wide range of guests on there. If you can't watch live, you can watch on demand or long highlights or short highlights, all in seven different languages. So we think we have got you covered for this race. As a reminder, it's available in all GCN Plus territories except for Latin America and New Zealand, whilst the short highlights are available everywhere, including, in fact, on GCN Racing's YouTube channel. It's not all about the Giro d'Italia this week, though. We've also got the five-day Tour of Hungary stage race starting on Wednesday, highlights of the Mallorca Challenge, which is another race postponed from the early season, plus two women's races as well. Uh, just bear with me as I build up to the names of these two races. It is the Classica Femina de Navarra, and on Thursday, it's the Imakamine Nafaleoki Classica. Uh, maybe Garcia, Annemiek van Vleuten and Anna van der Breggen are amongst the star riders on the provisional start list for those two races. You can also look forward to the Bradley Wiggins podcast by Eurosport through the Giro. We're going to have 10 of those in total over the three weeks, the first two of which you can listen to now. And in terms of films coming out this week on GCN+, two more as ever, one of which is the story of Hayley Simmons and her love of cycling. Uh, she was at a bit of a crossroads at the end of her university degree, but she found cycling and it turned out she was pretty good at it. Here's a quick trailer. I came into it late, pretty unfit, overweight. I got better and better. I wanted to get faster and faster and things got out of control, I guess. Take the speed up a bit. When you're a couple and one's coaching the other, that can cause friction. Nothing in a million years, dear. No, happy you... wife, happy life, Mark. Remember that. <laughs> oh. You know, now I can say, I'm one of probably not that many people ever to have won a Commonwealth Games medal for England. Hayley's a perfect athlete. She could lay out a very respectable power number and just keep going. No other woman has gone under 19 minutes for a 10-mile time trial. Three, two, one, go. I don't know what I'd be doing if I wasn't cycling. We shall move on now to the Vuelta Algarve, a race that normally takes place in February, but was postponed this year due to the pandemic, and that did have an impact on the overall level of the start list. Nevertheless, we did have seven World Tour teams present and some great racing, I've got to say. Sam Bennett took two more wins at the race to bring his season tally to seven, making him the most successful rider so far in 2021 in terms of pure win rate. On stage one, he got the better of Danny Van Poppel of Intermarché Wanty Gobert, and it was the same again on stage three. On that occasion, there was yet another example of why Michael Murku is the most respected lead out rider in the world right now. Such was his pace in bringing Bennett towards the line. He managed to nab third place himself. The first of the GC days came on stage two, though, with a summit finish to Foyer, uh, where some of you will remember it was Remco Evenepoel who won last year. On this occasion, Ineos Grenadiers had strength in numbers with three riders in the final group of six, and they perfectly set up young Ethan Hayter, who outsprinted Joao Rodriguez and Jonathan Lastra to the line. Two days later, it was the individual time trial. A Danish national champion Kasper Asgreen blitzed around the course to take the stage win and move himself up to third on GC. But behind him, all eyes were on the yellow jersey of Hater. And he was going fast, a little too fast, in fact, on this left-hander. A nasty crash there for the Brit, and it was a surprise to see him get back on a spare bike and continue on his way. Two, a top 10 result on the day, ninth to be precise, and he'd actually increased his lead in the GC over Rodriguez. 
However, it would be the final day that would decide the overall outcome, and the local squad of W52 FC Porto could sense blood, almost literally, after haters crashed the previous day. They set up Rodriguez for the final climb to the finish, and whilst it was Elie Gesbert of Arkea Samsic who took the stage win, the Portuguese rider had done enough to seal the overall title and the first home win there for 15 years. It was another Rodriguez who reigned supreme at the Tour of Rwanda, Christian Rodriguez of Total Direct Energy. It was a good race for the French teams, actually, who took home six of the eight stage wins. Alain Boileau took three of those for B&B Hotels, presented by KTM, whilst another of their riders, Pierre Roland, took his first win in almost four years on stage six. It was on that stage that Rodriguez went into the leader's jersey, but they had their work cut out to defend that lead, particularly on the short final stage with the cobbled climbs around Kigali. A tropical rainstorm swept in over the closing stages of the race, creating treacherous roads and causing a number of crashes. Emerging unscathed and victorious on two fronts was Rodriguez. He not only sealed the overall win yesterday, but also took the stage win, his first two wins as a pro rider. Canadian James Piccoli and American Alex Hoon rounded out the podium spots in second and third, respectively. Spare a thought, though, for Carlos Quintero. The Colombian came close to victory on stage one and even closer two days later. His heart broken at the line after being away solo for much of the final 40 kilometers of that stage. Talking of the final stage, though, with the infamous Murda Kigali, it's quite a strong candidate to host the UCI World Road Championships in 2025. The UCI president, David Lapartion, was present at the start of the Tour of Rwanda, and he announced that Africa would play host to the World Championships in 2025, although the country is yet to be confirmed. Uh, nevertheless, it will be the first time that Africa has hosted that event, and I'm sure it will be spectacular wherever it is. And finally, the women's peloton was back in action in Spain last week at the Vuelta Setmana Ciclista Valenciana. Annemiek van Fleurten crashed on stage one, but that didn't stop her winning the stage by over two minutes from Mavi Garcia. Sandra Alonso gave the home nation something to cheer about the following day in a bunch sprint, which was also the outcome of stage three, but there was Alice Barnes who took her first win in almost two years for Canyon SRAM. On the fourth and final stage, Erska Zigart of Team Bike Exchange took her first ever pro win, something her boyfriend, Tade Pugaccia, was enormously pleased about. And it was actually a 1-2 for that team on the day, with Ariana Fidanza taking second. No doubt about the overall winner though, Van Fleurten maintained her two minute advantage from stage one, giving her her fourth win of the year so far, and the Mobistar women's team their seventh. Moving on to some other news now. In recent weeks, De Koenig Quickstep have announced the contract extension of three key riders, Alaphilippe, Asgreen and Avonapool. But last week, they announced that two more star riders would not be with them after this year, Joao Almeida and Sam Bennett. Now, the sprinter has been linked with his former team, Bora Hansgrohe, whilst we're unclear about the future of Almeida. What we do know is that Jorga Mendes, the famous football agent, is now part of Almeida's team, though, so maybe it'll be Manchester United. We'll wait and see. Meanwhile, Wout van Aert revealed on social media that he's recovering from appendicitis. I guess it's the best time of year for him to be affected by something like this. But he says he looks forward to recovering and building up towards the Tour de France and the Olympics. And finally, at the Mountain Bike World Cup last week, Mathieu van der Poel won the short track cross country, but didn't have things his own way at the longer cross country yesterday, only managing seventh. Tom Pidcock, despite starting in about 100th position, managed to finish fifth, but the winner was Viktor Koretsky, whilst the women's race was won by Leona Lecomte. Right, that is all for this week. Don't forget to join our coverage for the Giro Italia throughout the rest of this week. It's on every single day because the first rest day doesn't come until next Tuesday. See you very shortly, but goodbye for now.